Greetings, family. Greetings and salutations. Welcome to Harrell Kegler Presents. I am Dr. Jamil Harrell Sims, and this is an introduction to a seven part series that we call Blacknificent, honoring and teaching the hidden, lesser known, our story told by our perspective and our scholars that the educational system willfully neglected to teach us. Family, I want you to like, subscribe, push the button if you want to be notified about any other videos that we have coming. And we really welcome you to complete the whole series because we are going to educate your mind and give you the truth. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to introduce our resident scholar for today. And his name is Harold Shuja Baker, a Detroit native co-founder of the African Restoration Project that he's been facilitating for the last 10 years. And he is also an engineer. Uh, he has worked on NASA projects and he's currently a, a mechanical and manufacturing engineer with over 30 years experience. Welcome Brother Suja. Hey, welcome, good to be here. Good to be here and good to participate in this project. I am so glad that you're participating because our family, our people, our culture, they've, they've got to learn some truth. Um, today's topic, family, is a result of a conversation, some research, some documentaries that I've been watching regarding who we are uh, as Africans, as Aboriginals. And it kind of started with this. Uh, just recently, the country of Mexico has decided after all these years to recognize the indigenous Aboriginal Africans who are in Mexico. Uh, they are located, uh, a large number of them are in Costa Chica, they're in Veracruz and Osaka. And all this time, they have not been recognized in the census. Finally, actually in 2020, they decided to recognize them. But the issue is for us is we have always been there. Uh, brother, pick, come on in and, and give a little background. Oh no, you just, you hit the nail on the head there. Um, we have always been here. There is this um, uh, false perception that um, the Americas were discovered, right? Uh, mm -hmm. As if, as if, uh, they had been an unoccupied land mass, and uh, they didn't come into the light, so to speak, until Europeans landed here. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth. How do you discover a land that's already occupied? Come on, you know. I say. It's absolutely no sense. And the fact that Mexico uh, is overcoming some of its own uh, barriers uh, to common sense and decency and recognizing the, uh, the African people who have been there uh, since before its inception is a step in the right direction. But it's completely in line with the reality because as you point out, uh, we have always been here. And uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to sharing information on that uh, from a, a, one of our most highly regarded scholars uh, as we get into this presentation today. Yeah, so, you know, we, we've gone through these changes and we've allowed other people to name us. Yes. Uh, without knowing who we are. We've been colored, we've been Negro, we've been the other word, uh, black, which is powerful, and then African-American. And now they're calling us people of color, which really doesn't speak to who we are because anyone with color can go into that category. And so today, uh, Brother Shuja is gonna bring us a great lecture. And more importantly, we can tell you anything, but we've got to back it up. He's bringing the receipts. Yes, Brother? indeed. Yes, indeed. Well, I'll go ahead and take it from here. Um, it's my pleasure today to present this, this talk, uh, this lecture, this presentation. Uh, I'm going to base my, my presentation today on the work of one of our most prominent scholars, uh, Dr. Ivan Van Sertema, who became an ancestor in 2009. Uh, let me go on and get into my presentation here. Let me uh, let's see, you don't have me. I need to be uh, able to share my screen. Okay, no problem. We're going to take care of that right now. 
All right, brother, go on and share that screen. Try that again. All right, here we go. And I'm gonna do this right here. All right, do you see that? Yes. yes. All right, you get it up full screen. All right, so again, um, Dr. Sams mentioned that I am co-founder of the African Restoration Project, uh, originally of Long Beach, um, also of Pomona and Los Angeles. And I've been coordinator uh, of that, that uh, cultural, um, African history and cultural st culture study group for over 10 years. So this is one of the presentations that I created uh, several years back and I've updated it with some additional information and everything and I'm happy to share it uh, with you today. It's titled Ivan Van Sertima on the African presence in ancient America. They came before Columbus and more. Uh, that's reference to one of his books. Um, so let's get started then. So who is Ivan Van Sertima? Ivan Van Sertima was born on January 26, 1935 in Guyana, South America. He transitioned on May the 25th in 2009. Uh, that's Malcolm's birthday. Uh, he was educated at the School of Oriental and African Studies in London and the Rutgers Graduate School and holds degrees in African Studies and Anthropology. Uh, he served as a press and broadcasting officer in the Guyana Information Services in the late 50s and during the 1960s. He broadcast weekly from Britain to Africa and the Caribbean. He was a literary critic, a linguist, and anthropologist who was prominent in all three fields. Um, he authored several major literary reviews published in Denmark, India, Britain, and the United States. Uh, he was honored for his work in this field by being asked by the Nobel Committee to nominate candidates for the Nobel Prize in Literature from the years 1976 to 1980. He was honored as a historian of world repute by being asked to join UNESCO's, that's United Nations, uh, UNESCO's International Commission for Rewriting the scientific and cultural history of mankind. It's hard to, it's hard to imagine a bigger project than uh, being called to participate in a rewriting of the scientific and cultural history of mankind. Uh, during his field work in Tanzania in 1967, he compiled the Swahili Dictionary of Legal Terms. He is the author of the highly acclaimed work, They Came Before Columbus, The African Presence in Ancient America, which was published in 1977 um, to high acclaim and criticism. He also authored Early America Revisited, a book that has enriched the study of a wide range of subjects from archaeology to anthropology and has resulted in profound changes in the reordering of historical priorities and pedagogy. A professor, um, he's a, he was a professor of African studies at Rutger, Rutgers University uh, and was also a visiting professor at Princeton University. He was the editor of the Journal of African Civilizations, uh, which he began in 1979. And uh, I have a video clip of him later in the presentation where he'll talk about uh, what compelled him to uh, create the Journal of African Civilizations and has published several major anthologies which have influenced the development of multicultural curriculum in the United States and also uh, done tremendous work to uh, rescue and reconstruct the African contribution to the world in Europe, Asia, America, and all over the world. So it's a pleasure to present uh, this information. Um, and I must say that several of my friends um, and colleagues uh, had personal relationship with uh, Ivan Van Sertima. I wasn't one of those, unfortunately. Um, I was just telling a, a, a buddy of mine yesterday about this presentation and he went into a litany of stories about his personal experiences with Dr. Ivan Van Sertima. And I didn't have that, that fortune, but nevertheless, I have profound and extreme respect for his intellect and his work, his work, at, his work ethic. That man put in some work and my appreciation for him increased as I compiled this presentation several years ago. Van Sertima's work on the African presence in ancient America directly relates to his studies on the African presence in ancient Mexico. They're related. Right, so uh, uh, one, one draws from the other. Um, Dr. Van Sertima contends that African people not only arrived in the Americas before Columbus, but also before Christ, before in the BC area 
era or the BCE era, before the common era, where he boldly declaimed that the history of the world needs to be rewritten. So that uh, UNESCO project was right on time for him, right? Dan Serdema's conclusions are still dismissed by certain establishment scholars today. But as we will see in the evidence that I'm going to present, it is collectively irrefutable. I mean, you can't dismiss all of this information unless there is a related agenda that precedes the evidence. And of course, we know that for some people that is absolutely the case. There is an agenda where they don't want to concede to the African presence in America uh, before Columbus or before the enslavement period, uh, uh, to be more exact. Um, I'm using three primary references for this talk today. Uh, the first is the book, They Came Before uh, Columbus, which was groundbreaking. The second is the transcript of the testimony that Ivan Van Sertema was called to present before Congress on July the 7th, 1987. That was as uh, uh, Congress was preparing for the big celebration of the uh, 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 500 year anniversary of, uh, the, of Columbus supposed discovery. Um, one of the things that came out of that uh, a testimony was that the word discovery was removed from the conversation about Columbus as it relates to uh, the United States. And we'll get into that a little bit later. The third reference is the African presence in early America published in 1992, which includes a 1991 presentation um, that Van Sertema gave before uh, the, for the Smithsonian, which was titled Evidence for an African Presence in Pre-Columbian America. There are three different eras that are covered by Van Sertema's work. I've already spoken to them. We have the pre-Christian period or, or the BCE, the before the common era. And then we have the period before Columbus in 1492 and after Columbus in 1492. A great portion of the evidence focuses on contact with the Olmecs from 948 to 680 BCE. Um, uh, Van Sertima posits Olmec civilization as the mother civilization of the Americas or Turtle Island. Uh, Olmecs precedes the Mayan, the Aztec, and the Incas, and all others uh, there in South America and in Southern Mexico. Um, and, and I should mention that, that this presentation is really just a summary of Van Sertima's work. Of course, in the time that we have today, I don't have time to do a, a full in-depth analysis, but I wanted to present uh, the book. Uh, they came before Columbus and the additional material. Um, so all of that is reflected. That includes a snapshot of 14th century Mandingo contact in Mexico, along with broader North American and South American contact with Africa, Africans uh, traversing the Atlantic and making it uh, to those lands. Um, I, because of, because of this information that I came upon, I deeply resent the words, the terms Indian or Native American, where we're talking about what can only be properly referred to as uh, indigenous people. And there's reasons for that we'll get into in the presentation. Uh, one of the things that I like about uh, Van Sertima is that he doesn't claim that everything is African, like some scholars do. They, they claim Africa, um, African everything, and that everything, main things that, uh, primary things that uh, uh, are done around the world uh, um, are directly borrowed from Africa. Whereas Van Sertima, he, he certainly doesn't diminish the African contribution, but he speaks more to the African influence and he's able to show how through the contact between uh, two different cultures, there are certain elements that were adopted or adapted um, and, and speaks to the African influence in that respect. And I appreciate that. Uh, and of course, for a more complete understanding, he has a considerable list of books and recordings, um, some of which include as author, um, the 1968 Caribbean writers, critical essays that he published, one of his early works, then, of course, in 76, they came before uh, Columbus uh, by Random House. And then in 1999, The Lost Science of Africa, an overview. This is a brilliant man, uh, a multi-genius multi in, in, in several different uh, disciplines. And then as editor, of course, he, he compiled the Journal of African Civilizations from 1979 to 2005 and several anthologies that he's edited, Blacks in Science, 
African presence in early Europe. Um, he did a, a, a work on Sheikh Anta Joe um, under the title Great African Thinkers. Uh, he did Great Black Leaders, Ancient and Modern. He did Black Women in Antiquity. Uh, then, of course, there's the transcript of his testimony before Congress. He wrote um, or he edited The Golden Age of the Moor, uh, Egypt Revisited in 1993, and Early America Revisited. Um, he also co-edited African Presence in Early Asia with Renoka Rashidi, uh, who is another one of our scholars who is seen sort of as the heir of the legacy of Ivan Van Sertiman and continuing uh, his work to show the African presence around the world. Van Sertiman's teachings. Um, Van Sertiman refers to Africa and pre-colonial America as shattered worlds, quote unquote, shattered worlds. And in that he explains that these shattered worlds can't be studied like Europe uh, uh, can be studied. Europe, of course, has an, has an archival continuity in spite of its many wars. There are uh, a trail of books that can be studied, right, to gain insight and understanding on, Af on European history and culture. Uh, but these shattered worlds, Africa and uh, pre-colonial America, they can't be studied through books alone, in part because there were deliberate efforts to destroy uh, book, certainly on the continent, that's, that's widely known. Um, and he speaks to at least three systematic wholesale burnings of books in America, speaks specifically to the Inquisition of Mani in 1562, where, Cat, where the Catholic Bishop of the Yucatan, Diego de Landa uh, Calderon said, as it relates to their books, burn them all. They are the works of the devil. Can you imagine that? Out of the thousands of books, uh, there that, that were to be found. As few as six of those books remain, as hard to believe as that is. It's difficult for me to wrap my mind around that. You can't, uh, you can't kill the truth. Centuries of knowledge lost there, you know, with that, with that effort. Or um, not, not, not lost perpetually, you know, uh, but certainly lost to the, to the curious who would seek to uh, go to find that history in books. Um, there's no archival continuity. Where there's no archival continuity, we have to dig deeper, right? It requires study in a variety of fields to reconstruct history. That includes linguistics, metallurgy, botany or plant life, uh, skeletal remains, art and cartography or oceanography, maps, and things of that sort. And Van Sertema uh, 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 interjected all of these in his work. He's an anthropologist, so he, he studied broadly. There was a point where he studied botany for almost a full year and, and, and faced threats of losing his position at Rutgers because of it. But he understood that this was necessary in order to have a qualified understanding of this history so that it couldn't be refuted. Um, and I'm thankful that he had that understanding as an anthropologist. Of course, that's what allowed him to make such a unique contribution, right? So the question becomes uh, on, this, on this notion of, of African presence in the Americas and whether African-American people are indigenous to this land or whether we were all uh, imported here, enslaved, uh, the question becomes how did Africans travel to America besides through enslavement, the, uh, the story that we're, we're so widely familiar with. And um, why? Van Sertema believed that it was by accident. How? He, he maintains by Atlantic circular currents, circular currents or marine highways that exist in the Atlantic Ocean that can be found uh, about 100 miles off the western coast of Africa. There are a series of uh, three or four different uh, circular currents, and I'll show images of, of those in a minute. And, and those currents will move anything that floats off the coast of Africa to the Americas, to, to the eastern shore of, of, of what's now the United States, to the Gulf of Mexico, or to South America. And we'll see those uh, in a moment. On this question, uh, uh, Van Sertima states, it is my contention, and I quote, it is my contention that a small but significant number of men and a few women 
and a fleet protected by a military force moved west down the Mediterranean Sea toward North Africa in the period somewhere between 94 to 680 BCE, probably on a common trading expedition and got caught in the pool of one of the Western currents off the North African coast, either through storm or navigational error, error or some type of equipment failure. Um, a map showing the flow of these Atlantic currents illustrates how easily such a crew blown off course could land in the Olmec heartland. The Olmec heartland is in Southern Mexico, uh, approaching South America, we'll see that in a map. He further said, a study of the same map, however, would show how difficult it would be for them to retrace their course and return to Africa unless they were also fully aware of the circular distribution of the currents in the Atlantic. Africans became aware of this so of circular return route, but much later. And again, I will show a map of these currents in a moment. The thing to note about this is that um, um, Van Sertema shows us receipts, so to speak, of conquest between African cultures and indigenous uh, American cultures, groups of people. And, and it was a friendly con uh, uh, contact. Uh, where, where, where cultural influence and exchange of culture and ideas occurred without conquest. And that's significant to know, right? Van Sertema built on the work of several scholars. He was not the first to suggest an African presence in the early Americas. And of these scholars listed here, several were his direct uh, colleagues. Um, uh, Jose Melgar, Matthew Sterling, uh, Clarence Wyant, Alexander von Wootenau, and Rafik Jirazaboy, and others. Jose Melgar was the first Mexican to discuss an African presence following the first discovery of African heads or the Olmec heads in 1858 in Tres Apotes. The Olmec heads are huge uh, concrete statues of, with Africoid features and African hairdress that was reflective of that era, right? We'll, we'll see images of those and discuss those a little bit further coming up. Matthew Sterling and Clarence Wyatt, who were researchers for the Smithsonian Institute, National Geographic, and the University of California, did the first intensive scientific excavation in 1938, right, uh, uh, in this region. Alexander von Wootenau was an American art historian who spent 45 years in Mexico and found countless clay statues or terracotta and stele or engraved stone tablets that had that were distinctly African, right? And uh, uh, von Wootenau became a personal friend of, of Alexander of, of, of Van Sertema. Uh, he, he caught some he caught some flack from Van Sertema too, and we'll talk about that in a moment. And uh, Rafik. Jirazaboy was a cross-cultural historian who wrote of the ancient Egyptian presence and influence in the Americas. Imagine that, ancient Egyptians made it from that portion of Africa all the way around into the Americas, and we're gonna see exactly how they did that. Um, so again, uh, Van Sertema wasn't the first to suggest an African presence in the Americas, Columbus, Christopher Columbus, in fact, was the first to make that uh, suggestion, at least in the modern world, mm -hmm. um, on the journey of the second voyage, where they landed in Española, which is now uh, uh, Haiti, the natives told him that Black people had come from the southeast with huge ships trading in gold-tipped spears. And those spears were sent for analysis in Spain, where it was determined that the metal composition was identical, identical to African spears that were uh, available from African Guinea at that same time. Ferdinand Columbus, who was his son, wrote that Columbus encountered blacks north of Honduras. During his first joy voyage in 1492, uh, that followed in the same year, the fall of the Moorish empire in Spain. And the Moors were noted seamen. So it, it, it is rather curious, to say the least, or, or, or coincidental, if you believe in coincidences, that, that when the Moorish Empire fell in January, that, that Columbus made his expedition later that year, right? And, and he wasn't the smartest guy. 
you know, uh, um, his navigators were Africans, right? And, and, and when they found themselves off course, nevertheless, he thought he was in India, which is why the West Indies, the Caribbean is known as the West Indies. That's why uh, uh, indigenous people were referred to as Indians because they thought they were in India, right? Um, he also thought that Cuba was a continent, that <laughs> South America was an island, that the Caribbean Sea was the Gulf of the Ganges River. All of this is contained in, in, in Van Sertima's uh, uh, writings and is derived from the, the, uh, the diaries of Columbus. So um, that's interesting to say the least. Just take a quick look at some of these images. This we're looking at here is, is something of a zoomed in image of the Gulf of Mexico. And we're focusing here on um, this region right in here where I have the red dots. Um, these, I'll reference four key locations here. Uh, Tres Apotes, which is here. Um, La Venta, which is here. And San Lorenzo, which is here. Uh, La Venta was the holy capital of Olmec civilization, right? And uh, Tres Apotes, that's the site of the uh, discovery of the first Olmec head. And when I said large, I mean huge, about nine, 10 feet tall, six, seven, eight feet wide, you know, uh, and we'll see some of those in just a second. And San Lorenzo, of course, was one of the uh, early Olmec settlements, and we'll be making reference uh, uh, to uh, Izapa, which, uh, we're, which will be referenced in some of the ritual images that we'll be sharing. This is zoomed out a little bit to show uh, the area here, just north of Guatemala and, and southern Mexico, here in the Gulf, uh, showing us here uh, Florida and uh, Texas, so that we can see where that is in relationship to where we are uh, over here. California, where we are, is a little bit over this way. Um, let's see. And then this image right here shows the uh, uh, ocean currents, right? And it shows how if you come from this area over here, coming from the Nile Valley region, make your way over here and you get caught up in a current right here that moves you in this direction down and around and you find yourself, you could get caught up here. It would take you into the Gulf or take you to the Eastern, further North on the Eastern shore, or you get caught in, in the uh, current this way and it takes you into South America. Those currents are still active today. They're, this isn't speculation. This is well-documented and well-known. And of course the currents would return. These would, this is the return route uh, that, that uh, um, we, we were taught, that Van Sertima taught us the Africans learned about much later, but this is the return route that uh, uh, takes them back across the Atlantic. And again, these are, are, are well known and can be confirmed from other sources. And to prove how these, how this, uh, the, the ocean currents work, um, there was an effort in 1969 to replicate the, the, uh, the, the transiting of the Atlantic using a boat similar to the type of boat that would have been manufactured in ancient Kemet, uh, a reed boat. So in 1969, a papyrus reed boat replica was built by Africans and it was named the Heyerdahl Ra One, right? That boat set out to, uh, on the western, the west, from the western coast of Africa, destined with a, intending to make its way to the Americas and guess what? They lost steering in that vessel very early in the trip, but they made their way to the currents and the currents caused them to make their, make their uh, uh, commute from the North African port of Safi all the, way to the bar, all the way to Barbados, following the currents that I just showed. Here are some of our first images of the uh, uh, Olmec heads. Images are, uh, of these are the Olmec heads from Tres Apotes and San Lorenzo. Now you look at these images, and these images have the features of brothers in our families, brothers in our communities. Uh, um, I mean, there's no disputing that. And, and some of the headdress we'll see in a moment is reflective of African culture, not only the, the, the helmets that are worn, but the, the uh, hairstyles that are depicted as well. And it's, it's indisputable. Uh, with those uh, uh, broad noses and thick lips, those are distinctly Africoid uh, features. 
This image is among the first stone heads found with Africoi features found in trays of potees in 1862. These heads were buried. When I say, when I say found, I mean dug up. They had been buried in a deliberate effort to conceal this imagery, right? And, and it's believed that they were uh, uh, buried, of course, after the European invasion and all of that. So this shows the back of the Trezopodes head showing Ethiopian type braids, right? Um, mm -hmm. And that's another one of the, the, the features that made this indisputable. I mean, as if looking at the face isn't enough, you know, once you see, once you see those locks, then, you know, I mean, who else was doing that? Come on now. <laughs> that's, yeah, us. that's us. Yeah, here's an image um, of this, re this, this is from the chapter six in, in, um, in, the, in the text titled Mandingo Traders in Medieval Mexico. And here Van Sertima discusses the Mandingo presence, right? And this Mandingo head uh, is from 14th century Mexico, right? Showing, I mean, come on now, look at these features. Look at those lips, right? And, 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 it's, and it's deeply reflective of Mandingo culture, comparable to items found in, in on the continent, right? So those types of comparisons are, 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 they are, they are conclusive when they are merged with other evidence, right? This is an image, a replica of the San Lorenzo head, and it shows a leather helmet that was worn by Egyptian Nubian, Nubian military during the Ramesses era. First century BCE, again, lips, nose, headdress, uh, uh, locks, those types of features. This, this, this head was about 10 feet tall, nine to 10 feet tall, uh, six to seven feet wide, colossal, right? Mm. That head looks like a brother that I know, several of them, in fact. Here's a, uh, an image of another one of the heads compared to an image of a Nuba chief from Africa. Right, the, the, the African features are indisputable, irrefutable. And Van Sertima discusses the Nubians and Egyptians and their presence in ancient America in chapters seven through nine that are titled Black Africa and Egypt, the Black Kings of the 25th Dynasty and African Egyptian presence in ancient America. Here's an image of the Trays of head in 1938, we mentioned the, uh, the expedition that uh, Matthew Sterling and others did uh, at the behest of Smithsonian and National Geographic in 1938. Well, this shows this head, it was partially uncovered, right? And that'll be mentioned in a moment. Um, but they dug it up and you know, found, found it as it, as it is. Um, this is a image taken from the text that shows um, descendants of black governors of Ecuador, right? These were Zambo chieftains from uh, uh, what's known as Esmeraldas in present day Ecuador who visited Quito in 1599. They are shown here in Spanish dress and Indian ornaments, but were descendants of a group of 17 shipwrecked Africans who gained political control of an entire province of Ecuador in short af order after their uh, um, after their ship, after they shipwreck, and he discusses that in chapter in chapter two of the text. Here's another image of scholar Matthew Serling with the Laventa head in 1939. Um, this is the one that was first discovered partially buried by Tulane University in 1924. Why would it be buried? Except they're trying to hide that history, trying to hide that story. Also, um, he touches on in in the text the, uh, the uh, voyages of the great Mali empire during the time of Abu Bakari II and how um, the, the great Mali empire was larger, dwarfed the, the, the Roman empire, you know? I mean, Mali is a small country now by comparison, but the Malian empire occupied vast swaths of Western, uh, Western Africa uh, as shown here, um, Timbuktu, one of the great uh, uh, capitals of the of the Malian Empire is reflected here. This is an artist representation of Abu Bakari II, who is known to have sponsored voyages from uh, to ancient America from the Great Malian Empire. And Van Sertima discusses these 
voyages in chapter four in great detail called the Mariner Prince of Mali. He came over with hundreds of ships uh, uh, and brought vast wealth with him as well. Here's another image of Matthew Serling as the San Lorenzo head was excavated. Here's a photo of Van Sertema and uh, uh, Von Watanu, Alexander Von Watanu at Von Watanu's home having a discussion about some of the terracotta statues uh, that he discovered there in pre-Columbia, Mexico. This is another image of, of, of some of the, the Olmec heads photographs there and then the terracotta images are shown there in, uh, in his studio in Mexico. This right here is a jade carving uh, of an Africana Olmec. Um, and this, this image looks so much like brothers I know that I had to include a picture of a brother I know. Brother Jay from X-Clan. This image looks so much like Brother Jay that I had to put an a, a, a image of him next to it so that you could see the comparison. It's so uncanny, right? Um, that this, this sculpture, I should mention, was found in Mexico, uh, 1150 BC, with distinctly African features. How could it be suggested that uh, uh, African people had not arrived there and settled there? Here's another image. Um, this is an image of a uh, Egyptian showing the sitting posture from the uh, uh, Middle Kingdom. And this is where he began showing um, uh, similarities in artwork that reflect a connection between these two different cultures and these two different regions of Earth. So he's showing the sitting posture here and then showing another uh, Olmec jade carving found in Honduras. Um, in the same sitting position, right? And, and then of course with distinctly African features and the features of this uh, uh, carving reminded me of the features of, uh, of our dearly departed uh, uh, Congressman John Lewis, right? In his distinctly African features, right? So it's, 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 it's the, the comparison is uncanny. And then again, showing another uh, um, Olmec figure carved figure out of jade showing that same sitting posture as was reflected in the uh, uh, ancient Kemetic uh, art. So showing that similarity, again, combined with other evidence adds to the depth of the evidence, right? And then showing uh, two side by side here, here's a uh, Egyptian uh, carving showing a, a, um, a, a person sitting in a traditional sitting posture. That's from the old kingdom of Kemet uh, 2575 to 2150 before the Common Era. And then we have another Olmec Jade figure sitting in the same traditional African sitting posture, right? And that's from sometime between 1150 before the Common Era to 300 um, uh, in the Common Era. And again, the similarity is uncanny, right? Foot position is the same. Hand positions are the same. Knee positions are the same. Come on now. When you add this to the other evidence, it becomes almost irrefutable. Here are two other images. Again, an Egyptian in a traditional sitting posture and another Negroid, Africoid figure uh, from, from Mexico, right? Sitting in the exact same position, right? I mean, these types of things, again, add to the evidence and combine to, with the other evidence to make it collectively irrefutable. Uh, Clarence Wyatt. Is another uh, a scholar, contemporary scholar of Ivan Van Sertema. And, and he's interesting because uh, when, when uh, Ivan Van Sertema's book was published in 76 and he started receiving uh, criticism in 77, Clarence Wyatt was one of the first people to come to his defense. He even called uh, 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 Van Sertema to his home for a visit because he wanted to show him some of the evidence that he had showing an African presence in the Americas. And he showed him a series of books showing African presence here and showing African presence there. And, and Van, that caused Van Sertema to challenge him, saying, hold on, if you've known this for all of these decades, why have you been silent about it? Clarence Wyatt explained to him that, you know, I was, I was, I was trying to get my PhD at the time, and he was doing work for the Smithsonian and other establishment entities. He said, I couldn't talk about Africans there. 
I was trying to get my PhD. I was writing for the Smithsonian. He said, this was in 1940 when I was doing this. Look at what they're doing to you in 1977. Can you imagine what they would have done to me in 1940? And of course, Van Sertima had to relent. He had to accept that because, you know, he had fears that uh, his publication life, life as a publisher, a writer, an author, uh, would, be, would be diminished after revealing these truths. That's why he started African, um, a Journal of African Civilizations, and we'll hear him say that in a moment. I'll move through this one quickly. Uh, this is a, 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 another image from the text where he's showing the god Sokar. And this image at the top was a winged god standing on the back of a double-ended serpent in an Egyptian papyrus painting of the underworld. And that can be compared with the god at Izapa in, in Mexico. Um, in the Egyptian painting, the god stretches out his hand to hold up his wings. We see that. He also stands on the back of the same type of double-ended serpent and wears a foreign beard, right? So those types of features are so, I mean, the, the, the combination of them all in the same image, come on now, that, that there had to be a conversation had here, right? In order for, for what exists on the continent in, on, in Africa, to appear in the Americas. There absolutely had to be some type of contact, right? And he shows the same here, showing uh, of, uh, a study of Omec civilization reveals too many ritual traits that parallel the Egypto-Nubian world of the same period, that it can be no accident or coincidence. So let's briefly consider the royal and priestly dress and emblems of power among the Omecs and the Egyptians. We have the double crown, the double crown reflected here, um, uh, which was uh, um, brought into prominence with the joining of the two lands, right? The merging of, uh, uh, of the, first, the first dynasty, right? Uh, in Kemet with Pharaoh Narmer, who was also referred to as Menes, Menes popularizing the double crown. Uh, and this image is from a text, uh, Ancient Egyptians and the Chinese in America by uh, Raphael Jarazaboy. Uh, and it shows Olmec dignitaries with the, with the double crown. It shows also the royal flail, it, uh, cer with ceremony regalia of the, the, the pharaoh. It was all part of it. Uh, one or more pendants hanging from the staff. We see that on both of those. Um, we see uh, 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 in other images, the sacred boat not only appears in both civilizations uh, with the same function and shape, but it also has the same name. In ancient Mexican culture, the sacred boat was referred to as the Sipac, C-I-P-A-C. In ancient Egyptian cultures referred to as the Sibak, S-I-B-A-K. The use of the color purple was distinguished, was significant for distinguishing priests and people of high rank. The artificial beard, feathered fans and sunshades, these types of things were consistent in both cultures. Then of course, to, to end all speculation and to shut the whole conversation down with the ultimate receipts. There were skulls and skeletons examined and confirmed to be of African people, ultimately confirming the African presence. Now, what could be stronger evidence than that than to find the remains of the beings themselves, the humans themselves, and to be able to confirm with world leading expert in cranial studies Polish professor Andrzej Wersinski, who announced to the 41st Congress of Americanists in Mexico in 1974 that African skulls had been found, indeed found, at Olmec sites. He stated that the skulls showed a clear prevalence of the total Negroid pattern. So that left no further doubt, no further dispute, but at the same time, of course, many contemporary scholars coming out of European Academy and European School of Thought reject that, right? This image right here is just an artistic representation of uh, indigenous people greeting Africans. Uh, those black people who they talked about came from the Southeast and, and, and brought with them their culture and exchange cultural ideas and teachings and, 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 and human excellence between the two of them and there was contact without conquest, contact 
without conquest. No need to come in and dominate, control, deny humanity, and do some of the things that the Europeans did, right? Um, and I don't believe this presentation would be complete if I didn't take the opportunity to allow Ivan Van Sertima to speak for Ivan Van Sertima, right? In the modern world, we have the benefit of that. And of course, uh, there are uh, countless numbers of uh, videos uh, uh, and, and presentations available about uh, from uh, Ivan Van Sertima, but I wanted uh, to include presentation here where he would have the opportunity to speak for himself and you could hear these teachings, some of these teachings directly from him. So we have this interview from 1998 where Dr. Ivan Van Sertima was interviewed by a uh, Los Angeles scholar, Dr. Kwaku Person Lin. So I'll just get into that and let you hear that and then I'll close out afterwards. Our children are continuously being taught now that Columbus discovered America. Through your work and research, you have found something to counter this. Can you set us all straight now on this story about Columbus discovering America? Okay. Um, I appeared before Congress on July the 7th of last year. In fact, there's a special tape here, Van Sertima before Congress, and the transcript of the appearance before Congress, the congressional testimony. Mm -hmm. And I appeared before Congress because I had been invited to speak to the Congressional Overseas Committee, which was to look at what the Christopher Columbus Quincentenary Commission was doing. There's going to be a tremendous celebration in 1992, um, which will celebrate the so-called discovery of America by Columbus. I came to establish quite clearly that Columbus did not discover America, that that word is a word that should never be used because there were visitors, important visitors, significant visits and contacts and voyages long before Columbus. Mm -hmm. I'm not alone in that view. As early as 1964, the Congress of Americanists ruled there cannot now be any doubt that there were visits by, from the old world to America long before Columbus. So that is a myth that has been dismissed. People have come to accept the Vikings were there in 1000 AD because the Vikings are European. Nobody questions that. Mm -hmm. it, that has even entered some of our history books. Because, but because this involves Africans, and some of it is much earlier, 1000 AD is long after the Olmec. Mm -hmm. So some of the visits of Africans is after the Olmec period, some is before or during that Olmec period. Mm -hmm. Like the plant life, the Gossipium horse, Basim moved long before, moved from Africa to here long before the Olmec. Some visits are in the Olmec period. Some are in the medieval period, 14th century. Some are in the 15th century. Mm -hmm. Some are even around the Moorish period. And the thing that I want to close with is to point out that as a result of my testimony, the chairman of the Congressional Oversee Committee said clearly to the Quincentenary Commission that you should not, in the light of Van Sertman's testimony, you should not refer to these visits as discoveries. They should simply be called voyages or contacts. Mm -hmm. But the reason why this big discovery idea comes in is because European types who had conquered the world, who had carved up Africa, and taking over the Native American world. They want to claim that the world was asleep until they came, so that it was lying dormant until they discovered that other part of the world. And that is a word, therefore, has to pass out of our vocabulary. The other important thing is that Christopher Columbus himself was the first person to suggest, not I, that there were these people who had come and visited the Native Americans before him. They found as the inquiry that came out of my testimony that there was only one black on the commission. There were no Native Americans. This was being dominated by people who thought that they had actually created the New World, the Spanish, the Italians, mm -hmm. etc. All very well, Columbus was a great man to them, but to plant that myth upon the world and to make us feel that we are discovered people, that is very pernicious. Columbus, as I said to Congress, never once, never once put his foot on American landmass, north or south. He only went into the Caribbean, the mere periphery of America. He, on the third voyage, his ships landed in South America, but he did not set foot on the continent at all. 
I want to thank you very much because now the record can be straight and our children don't have to come home and ask us, did Columbus discover America? And now it's just voyages rather than discoveries. But after, this, after authoring the book that came before Columbus, I noticed you had mentioned one time about you did not feel that you were going to be published again mm -hmm. and that you felt a need for there was so much material out there that needed to be published that you started the Journal of African Civilizations. Why did you start this journal? Well, that was an absolute necessity. One thing became very clear to me, that I could waste my whole life pursuing that subject and that no one would ever take it seriously, that they had to take Africa seriously before they could actually look at that thesis seriously. Because mo most of the objections arose from the fact that people felt that this was absurd. If Africans, after all, were just primitives, if they had no great technology, if they had easily been defeated in the slave trade, how dare you suggest that they could cross the Atlantic, which Europeans had not yet crossed? Mm -hmm. How dare you suggest that they could influence a major civilization? So that I had to make, I had to, I made a conscious decision before I continue with this work and to pursue these threads, I had to spend at least 10 years, probably more, in developing a school of thought where one could draw upon a body of discovery and research all over the world, where one could establish that the African was not what he was thought to be that there were levels of technological complexity there in that continent, which we were not aware of and have not been aware of because we've been looking in the wrong place and because we have been, we've had a different notion and conception of the African. That is how I started the Journal of African Civilizations. Mm -hmm. And that led to major books like Blacks in Science, Ancient and Modern, where scientists from all over the world in the field of medicine, aeronautics, agriculture, pastoral farming, astronomy, metallurgy, um, scripts, etc., could establish clearly this was how it was mm -hmm. to provide vast bibliography so students could study anew, not just slave history, which is significant and valuable since it's the last chapter of our history, but to study what really happened before. Mm -hmm. Who was the African before he was shattered, before the slave trade had broken up his, his empires? What did he really do? What was that lost world? So here you have, for example, African presence in early America, his presence in the American continent, African presence in early Europe, his presence and impact on, on Europe, African presence in early Asia, his presence and impact on Asia, and a range of other works mm -hmm. that deal with the African. Um, these works have been, we, we now have about 10 of these titled works, mm -hmm. and they, they engage experts from all the, f the fields. Black women in antiquity, could you just give us a, a summary of what this is about, black women and in black antiquity? Black women in antiquity deals with the history of the black woman from very early times. It shows you the remarkable figure of the black woman in Egypt and Ethiopia. It shows you how black women had been turned into goddesses, not only by Africans, but Europeans. Mm -hmm. Europeans also worshipped black women. For example, the most important black woman in the world was Isis. Isis was the female aspect of God. Osiris was the male aspect of God. Isis was the female aspect of God. And she was a black woman. Mm -hmm. And the statues of Isis in Egypt were eventually transported, prototype, it became prototype um, for the black Madonna. So all over Europe, Europeans worshipped the black woman. And she had a little child, Horus, who became the Christ figure, so that after Jesus died, for a long time, even when he was accepted as the Christ figure, the black woman and her child, her black child, was accepted as Mary and Jesus. Mm -hmm. And then when these statues are broken up or lost, the Europeans would make new statues, some of them with European features, but black skin. Mm -hmm. So that became the black Madonna. You can still find many of them in Poland, in Spain, in the Soviet Union all over the world. Yeah. So <clears throat> Ivan Van Sertum's work was extensive. 
um, across a range of different disciplines as has been shared. Um, and he certainly applied the comedic teaching, man, woman, know thyself on a level uh, that we need more of, quite frankly. Um, and here's an image of him and his beautiful wife, Jacqueline. Uh, they were partners in love and struggle uh, until his final days. And I encourage everybody to dig a little bit deeper uh, into Ivan Van Serdem's teachings. There are four things that I would uh, highlight that uh, I take from, from his teaching uh, and from his message that we, just, that we just saw. First, that he was instrumental in causing the word discovery to no longer be used as an official term in the context of a discussion about, uh, um, in the context of a discussion about um, Columbus and, and his voyages. To, to the Americas. He also spoke about uh, how it was important and necessary to rescue and reconstruct Africa's contribution to the world in order to give credence to the notion of an African presence in early America, because how did these people, as he mentioned, how would these people get here if we, did, if we haven't established that they have the technological capacity to do that, right? So it was important for, for that work to be done as a precursor. And then he highlighted that slavery is the last chapter in our story, right? Uh, uh, even though it's presented, and, and as uh, uh, Dr. Quaker person Lynn uh, uh, referenced, talking about the children and how the children are, are taught that these things are our, our, our first story our, or our only story or the beginning of our history, when in fact they are the last chapter in our, in our story. And, and in order for us to uh, gain a meaningful uh, uh, appreciation, not only for what our people have, what our people have done, but what our people can do, then we need to have an understanding of that deeper history, right? And then, of course, his work has been uh, completely engrossed in that effort of, of, of rescuing and reconstructing a discussion about Blacks in science, Black women in antiquity, right? Uh, uh, the African contribution to Europe, to the Americas, to Asia. Uh, he is unparalleled in terms of the scope and scale of his work, rescuing and reconstructing the African contribution to the world. And I strongly encourage everybody within the sound of my voice to become familiar with the work of Ivan Van Cernan. Uh, um, uh, look for videos on his lectures. Um, and, and by all means, if, if, if you don't pick up any book, but they came before Columbus, then by all means, get that book and read it, study it, view it like I do as a sacred text, right? Because that's the source of the information that, need, that we need to get where we need to go. Absolutely, you know, just a couple of things is when you talked about where the Olmec heads were found in that area, that is modern day, uh, Osaka, that's Oaxaca. modern day. Yes, it's right yes. down the street. Yes. Uh, Veracruz. I yeah. was looking at the map. Veracruz is right there, yep. and uh, Osaka, Veracruz, and and Costa Chica. Yep. Huge African population, and uh, basically, what they found, and you can look up, uh, look this up, and I can give you some resources as well. What they found is that you know we do things in song. We are oral tradition people. We have no songs no songs about slavery at all. There's no record among them of coming, you know, running through, they were trying to say they came from Texas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Came from Texas and went into Mexico. They were already there. So oh, when the people kids say they were there. Right, they were already there. They have nothing documented amongst the people that said anything about slavery. So when we say we're American, you have to remember United States is not just is, is not the continent. We have North America, South America, Central America. We were already here. He landed on Turtle, Turtle Island, not in North America. Yes. And when people say go back to Africa, I find that interesting because you know we for our uh, Mexican brothers and sisters, you you can't deny this. You need to look it up. We need to stop just going about life and not researching who we are. We are the people of this 
continent. We're the, we are aboriginals. I prefer uh, to address myself as highly melanated aboriginal. Yes. Because the earth is what I'm native to, the yes, first indeed. and the last. Yes, indeed. And, and I, I, believe, I believe that we have to make a return to Africa, right? Um, but, but more so in a philosophical sense, mentally, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. we, need to, we need to make a, a, a reconnection with that history that precedes enslavement, right? Marcus Absolutely. Garvey taught us that people have done what people can do. And if we develop an appreciation and understanding for those things that we, those contributions that we made to the fourth world of human history before we were shattered, as Ivan Van Sertema says, then that gives us context and an understanding for what we can do going forward. And we most certainly do need to make that connection. But it's, uh, it, it's, it's the, the physical connection is important. We absolutely need to go back to the continent, but I claim the space that I occupy. I claim the space that I occupy, not only because I'm here, but because my ancestors helped build this place, you know, and it's a constant and ongoing effort to repair, reconstruct, and, and, and fulfill their vision for it. Later for what the founding fathers were talking about and all the so-called founding fathers and all of that nonsense, our ancestors toiled and, and left, their, left themselves in, in, infused in this land. So we would be, it would be ridiculous of us not to claim this as an indigenous as an indigenous right of our own, you know. So most certainly, uh, we have a right to claim this as as a claim uh, indigenous to this land. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that we dismiss, diminish, or deny the African origins of it all. Come on, yeah, it's, it all begins there. Uh, absolutely, foundational Black Americans. We we built this. We built this before they even came. And, an, and another thing I wanna say before we go is the temperament. I mean, our ancestors came here and worked with who have, you know, the indigenous, oh, they didn't come here to conquer and kill and, and maim and rape and, and pillage and plunder and do all these horrible things and, you know, put smallpox and blankets and run people off their land, such, such horror is not a part of our nature. Such horror is, is, is that's, those are things, you know, to us that are inhuman. And so, uh, but the one thing I will tell you is that if we don't learn who we are, you know, when kids ask me, why do they hate us so much? When I'm asked, you know, when the people say, well, uh, people of color, I, I cannot stand that term because that is so, it, it's too inclusive. If you wanna talk about foundational black Americans, diasporic Africans, say it. Don't include us in this great big pot with everybody else. So yeah. what I would say, uh, family who are watching this, I know you learned. And maybe this is the first time you've heard this because I'm gonna admit when I first heard it, I had a hard time processing because I had been indoctrinated to believe uh, that, that we really had no uh, connection here other than as slaves and building it. But if you sit back and I challenge you to talk to your elders, I challenge you to do that. You know, when they said you have Indian in you or so-and-so was an Indian, uh, Native American, I had a good conversation with my 85 year old mother. I learned a lot. When they're telling you that, you have to understand the dolls rules. You have to understand the $5 Indians you have to understand that they uh, would take some Aboriginal people. A lot of Aboriginals were classified as Negro. So this is your land. Yeah. Africa is also your land. Yeah. So know thyself. That's Dr. Ivan Van Sertifer. Know thyself. Study. This is the first of our series. And I, and I know this is powerful. And I know this is leaving you something to think about. But we have to learn our story because the conqueror always tells the tale according to how they see it. Yes. Well, I'll, I'll close with this. Um, those Africans who made it across the Atlantic, um, they didn't just bring their African features, their, their, their melanated skin and, and, and their knowledge and wisdom. They, they brought their values with them, right? 
and, and, and it's our values that define who we are, much more so than our physical being, right? Values that define the way we see ourselves in the world and the way we engage the world, the way we treat other people, the way we relate to other people. That is what makes us human. That's what defines what type of people we are. So when, when they traverse the Atlantic, they came here with a, a, a set of values that define who they are. They, they brought with them the ethics of sharing, which is a distinctly African feature. So of course, there was no need to conquer or, or no need to dominate in, in the way that Europeans you know, chose to when they came over here. So, I mean, on the question of identity, uh, there's a lot to be said about how we have embraced other people's conception of us and, and how getting back to a way of understanding ourselves that's in line with the way our, our ancestors understood themselves. Uh, I believe that would be the most fruitful for us. And ultimately, that's going to be grounded in the values that define who we are, that distinguish us from other people, and that uh, uh, establish without question, the divinity in our hearts. Absolutely. And I'll say this, um, for those who don't have the time, or maybe you just don't have the temperament to read Dr. Ivan Van Sertema's books, I would tell you as a scholar myself, always go to the back of the book and, and look at the bibliography and who they read and who they studied. If you don't believe what you're hearing, this is how you find the truth. Also, if you like watching documentaries, that's mainly 95% of what I watch. You need to look up Dane Calloway. You need to look like uh, uh, look at, uh, it's Carameo Oahu. Uh, you need to look at him as well because they have a lot of documentation. All you have to do is, 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 is Google it, YouTube it, and look at the receipts. Look up the people that they're talking about. If, so that you can further understand that this is the truth. Yes. I want to thank you. First of all, I want to thank, you know, our distinguished scholar, brother Harold Shuja Baker for spending this time and enlightening us on, you know, a, a very, our historical fact. Um, I also want to encourage you all to like, subscribe. I know you have comments. Uh, put your, your questions in the comments. We will answer them and we will direct you to whatever you need so that you can do your own study. We've got six more uh, to look at. We're going to be talking about what you have not been taught in school. Get ready. Make sure that your teenagers and your children and your elders are sitting in front of the screen. We're going to teach you some real truth. You got to have any last words, brother? No, I'm just uh, thankful to uh, have had the opportunity to participate in this series, and I'm looking forward to the uh, the ones to come. Absolutely, we've got a good another good brother, Dr. Quayley, uh, that's coming up next week. Sundays, two thirty on YouTube is when we post. All right. Forever forward, never backwards. Hotel, shalom, peace. This is Harrell Kager presents. Our story, Black Nificent. Thank you for attending. That was much better.